one, um, uh, summer 2017. And like I say, um, uh, your assessment for most of the course, 90% of the course, is going to be these section tests. Um, so there will be three of them. This is for 30% of your final grade. Uh, there are a total of six questions, totaling 30 points, five points each. Um, so each of them require a substantial amount of thought and um, it, it, it's analysis on your part. Uh, I typically ask you to either recount an argument or define terms making a distinction or something along those lines and then ask you to do something analytical. Now, um, before you start thinking I'm just being a jerk for doing this, um, it's, I'm going to refer you back to the course syllabus on page one, um, where they give me the course catalog description and the learning outcomes. And um, right at the bottom, the last three of the, um, the, the learning outcomes are to show students how philosophical theories have developed over time. Uh, we're plotting through a historical analysis of, um, of, 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 well, the history of Western philosophy. We started with Socrates, we're moving to Plato. Next, we'll be moving to Aristotle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Second, to develop students' facility in using log logic to analyze and evaluate philosophical arguments. This is precisely what I'm trying to do with these questions. And then finally, um, to develop students' facility in clear presentation of arguments in writing. So you have to write. So um, this is just what I'm required to make the course be. So um, it's uh, the, the, the testing method actually reflects that. Now, um, <clears throat> let me see here. Um, uh, there is some boilerplate um, from the, uh, the, the, the course syllabus. Right at the start, uh, this uh, is due uh, Monday, July 24th by 5 p.m. So you've got the weekend to work on it. Um, I give you the um, the description of section tests from the course syllabus, um, the missed assignment policy, which I went over in the welcome video, assignment submission. I'm reminding you that it's your responsibility to submit the assignment, submit the correct document, uh, submit it on time, and to make sure uh, that um, you've submitted um, your document properly. Um, and then I make a note about the zero tolerance policy on plagiarism in this course. Since these are substantial bits of writing that you'll be doing for like a paragraph or two per response, um, there are uh, six questions. So this can be quite a substantial sort of document that you're producing here. Um, I know it's tempting to go to the web and hit control C and control V, but um, I will find you and um, you will not benefit from it. Um, so please refer back to um, the course syllabus for the full on uh, plagiarism policy. Um, and if you're unsure how to properly cite sources, if you're using external sources, though, I have to say, these two books plus the video material plus um, the contents of your own head uh, should be enough to get you through this exam and that's probably the best way to get through this exam. Um, I've given you a substantial amount of analysis, my own plus others, and um, you've got the text uh, right in front of you. You've made notes on the videos, you've engaged with the discussion forum. Um, you should already have sort of a working understanding of um, the major moves um, that I'm highlighting. And um, it, in fact, I'm not touching on anything that I did not um, myself put substantial effort into trying to explain to you. Um, if you get stuck, uh, try the discussion forums. I have no problem with you guys um, collaborating. You, you're stuck on a Socrates question, uh, then uh, use the Socrates forum. If you're stuck in a Plato question, use the Plato forum um, to see if you can't clarify in some sort of plain language. But when you sit down to write your own response, that should be your own work and reflect your own effort. Okay. Um, so, short answer questions requiring a bare minimum of one paragraph of writing for your response. That's a paragraph. A paragraph is, by its very definition, a bare minimum of three sentences, but your responses should be substantial and exceed this minimum. 
a note about minimums. It, giving the minimum is a great way to get the minimum back in response. Uh, the idea is answer the question until the question is answered. Um, I, I like to think with these questions a paragraph or two should do it. Um, uh, I'm also using the term sentences. Uh, by sentences I mean full sentences. Don't give me point form responses or little diagrams that are meant to do the work of a sentence. Um, what you have to do is, as Oakland University requires me to do in this class, um, it develop students' facility and clear presentation of arguments in writing. A point form response is not a clear presentation of an argument in writing. So I need full sentences. Right, because a point form response, in order to get it to make sense, I have to do too much to it. Right? So if I just gave you bullet points um, in the way of my notes, or um, it, I just read bullet points off a piece of paper in these videos, you, you wouldn't get much of it because it makes sense in my head, but you have to do too much inferring in order to, in order to make sense of it. All right, so um, that's the idea. All right, so I need full paragraphs and full sentences in terms of a response. And you see, just just from how these questions are weighted, they're they're pretty substantial. Each question is five percent of your final grade. So um, uh, basically, what I'm going to do is go over each of these questions and see if I can't point you in the right direction. This is this is why these videos are important to engage with um, because they're kind of sort of lay it out for you um, so that uh, you know you know what to do so um, so <coughs> excuse me summer thing um, in the early part of Socrates trial defense he relates the story of how he became known as the wisest man in Athens remember his buddy came back from the Oracle at Delphi Socrates Socrates guess what guess what you're the wisest man so he tested his wisdom this story introduces an epistemological, that's theory of knowledge, um, position wherein, quote, human wisdom is worth little or nothing, end quote. Five Dialogues, page 27. But on the basis of this epistemological claim, Socrates is still able to ground positive ethical claims. So, we know nothing, yet there's this whole laundry list of positive actions that we should take from this negative claim to knowledge. Right? Discuss this transition from epistemology to ethics. That's your task. A um, variety of ways you can go about this. You may actually lay it out in terms of a narrative. You, you may use an example. Um, I gave you an example in the Socrates video um, of, um, you know, I use the Athenian example, um, women weren't fully citizens for a whole laundry list of reasons that were really held as dogma and prejudice. Demanding reasons become, so it's basically a position that demands moral reasoning, right? Because the closest we're going to get to knowledge is testing our wisdom by Socrates' example. So anyhow, um, it, that's, that's the first question um, and a substantial portion of the Socrates video actually engaged with this. And so um, that should be fairly straightforward. Um, if you look around online, you may also find uh, a, an older video that I gave you called Socrates Moral Position. I can't recall if I put it in the, um, the, the, the playlist that I gave you. Um, or not, but um, nonetheless, it's there and it addresses this question. So if you check my YouTube channel, you might just find that. Um, question two, Socrates on page 35 of your five dialogues, this is still in the Apology, pre presents an argument where he compares himself to a gadfly. And the horse flies literally calling himself a pain in the ass. In what respect is he like a gadfly, and why is this important by his argument to the city-state of Athens? So basically what I'm asking you to do is unpack the metaphor. Gadfly is a horse, fly bites the horse on the ass, shocking it to alertness. In what respect is Socrates like the horse fly? In what respect does he bite 
the sluggish horse and in what respect is the sluggish horse that is Athens um, sluggish. Right. So unpack the metaphor is step one. Right. Outlining the argument for democracy we discussed, that's I discussed in the, um, the video there, how does the gadfly argument support a case for the protected rights of freedom of speech and by extension in our modern, modern political context, freedom of the press. Remember, this is it, it relates to your discussion forum question too, because I mean, to a certain extent here, he's saying that, that voting, just voting isn't enough, right? You need these kind of gadfly activities to shock people into alertness and get them to do the actual work it takes to engage properly with a democracy. So um, you should have a lot of background on that question as well. Now, number three, and this gets us halfway through, um, and it's one on the uh, the Crato, uh, the second of the five dialogues that we read, uh, the third in the book kind of thing. Um, in his fictional conversation with the laws of Athens, Socrates introduces the distinct but related notions of the social contract and tacit consent. Briefly outline this argument, the, the argument he had with the laws of Athens, um, and just do a very general job kind of thing, right? Um, it start with the theory of justice and uh, you do follow the argument through with the laws of Athens. Defining each of these distinct but related notions. So it's as you outline the argument, define the social contract and tacit consent. It becomes really clear if you see the structure of the argument. By your analysis of this argument, you see now I'm having you use logic to analyze um, uh, and evaluate philosophical arguments, right? Um, by your analysis of this argument, what sort of duties are implicit to democratic citizenship? Recall when I was um, laying out the Apology and the Crito, um, it's, I, I tend to see the Crito as an argument for protected political rights, which the previous question, the Gadfly argument, drove towards. Right? Now I've moved to the Crito, which I tend to see as an argument for duties in the context of a democracy. Right. If you're doing your civic duty, if you're doing your duty in the context of your political arrangement, then da 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 da. And I laid that out nicely in the video for you. So um, that should be, again, fairly straightforward. So that's Socrates. Then uh, there are three more questions um, and, and, and relating to Plato. Number four is briefly discuss the constitution of the soul. And then I quote the passage from the Phaedrus um, on page 30 for you. Or what we must say about its structure. Right? Offered by Plato in at the start of Socrates' second speech. Right? This is that myth of the charioteer, the chariot driver, and the team of winged horses. Right? One good from good stock and the other one uh, more or less the opposite right impetuous that wants what it wants when it wants it kind of thing so what's he i gave you a pie chart right um so just lay out the parts of this whole right discuss um how plato's description of the constitution of the soul might expand what I call the moral psychology of Socrates as introduced in our discussion of the Apology. The, remember back in the Apology I was laying out um, as part of one of the arguments in Socrates' defense, um, what I call the Socratic dicta, and right? uh, three propositions which are implicit to um, Socrates' position. Knowledge is virtue, those that know the good do the good, and evil arises as an involuntary error due to ignorance. So um, this is something Kierkegaard will actually question Socrates on later. Uh, Socrates has no positive account, no mechanism in his position for how somebody might know the good and still bloody well not do it. Right? I knew it was wrong, but I went ahead and did it anyway. Right? Uh, there's no mechanism there for Socrates. 
Now, one of the advancements of Plato over Socrates, it's frequently argued, is that Plato's constitution of the soul and the tensions he introduces there offer an account of how we might know the good, but still bloody well not do it. All right. um, and uh, your big hint um, comes on page 18 of uh, the Phaedrus, where he defines, and recall in the video I called your attention to this definition of eros, the unreasoning desire that overpowers a person's considered impulse to do right and is driven to take pleasure in beauty. Its force reinforced by its kindred desires for beauty in human bodies. This desire, all conquering in its forceful drive, takes its name from the word for force and is called eros. Well, eros is just an example of a mechanism that Plato describes that can account for how we can know what the right thing to do is and still not do it. All right? There's a tension there that overpowers a con person's considered impulse to do right uh, that Socrates didn't acknowledge. So this is an advancement. Um, so anyhow, uh, step one, discuss the constitution of the soul, uh, the soul structure. Now, um, the step two, right, introduce the advancement produced by Plato in terms of the moral psychology. Uh, it's, I probably mentioned Socrates, those that know the good do the good, and evil arises as an involuntary urge to ignorance as well. So um, that's that question. I know these questions are a lot. Right? Um, define a thing, analyze it. Right? It's, they, they all ask you to do like a couple of things. Right? Um, Okay, two more questions. Um, one of the chief elements, number five, right? Uh, one of the chief elements of Plato's defense of love, I've got live here, I'll correct that before I post it, is that it brings us closer to uh, knowledge of the perfect truth of the forms. Briefly introduce both Plato's theory of the forms and theory of recollection. Um, that Plato's Theory of Forms beginner um, video actually does a pretty good job of doing this. Um, I went over it in my videos as well, um, in the third one that I posted. So um, you should have some background there. Plus, um, in addition to the video material I mentioned here, I found another School of Life Plato, the Forms video um, that I posted for you as well. So um, you should have lots of resources for this first Part, right, so this is Plato's Metaphysics and Epistemology that I'm asking you to lay out here. And this question is a question because I, I can't see you getting through Plato without understanding the two major aspects of Plato's Metaphysics, his position, that is his Metaphysics and Epistemology. This is just sort of what Roderick would call a, a, a regular sort of thing to know about Plato, right? Um, so, briefly introduce Plato's theory of the forms and recollection. The theory of recollection. Then, how does the special character of beauty serve to justify Platonic love in the context of his argument? And for that one, where is it here? I want to say page 39. I've got it underlined in pink. Um, page 39. Um, vision, of course, is the sharpest of our bodily senses. Although it does not see wisdom, it would awaken a terribly powerful love if an image of wisdom came through to our sight as clearly as beauty does, and the same goes for the other objects of inspired love. But now beauty alone has this privilege to be the most clearly visible and most loved. So what's the special character of beauty? We can actually bloody well see it. Well, how does that fit into the puzzle between Plato's metaphysics, here are the forms that we want to know, and his epistemology, the theory of recollection. This is how we go about it. So what's the trick to get to know the forms? And how might the form of beauty offer some sort of special way into this knowledge of the truth? 
It's sort of the main movement that Plato's making in terms of justifying platonic love. Now, right at the end of my videos, um, it's, I presented sort of a bonus element of Plato's metaphysics, the theory of the forms and the theory of the soul, right? Um, so, um, you, you, for this one, you may have to go back to um, the general introduction and pre-Socratics video in order to sort of refresh your understanding of Heraclitus and Parmenides because it relates to this question. A bonus element of Plato's metaphysics, his theory of the forms and theory of the soul, and epistemology, his theory of recollection, is that it serves to, Plato's position generally, serves um, to resolve the contradiction between Heraclitus and Parmenides that we discussed in the general introduction and pre-Socratics video. Briefly discuss how these elements of Plato's position accomplish this. Remember, forms up here, world of appearances down here, uh, change multiplicity flux, being is simply that which is, that which is not, cannot be. Somehow they get to both be right and not contradict one another. So um, I've just given you too much here. Um, and this is why it's important to watch these videos um, like I say, uh, study, study, uh, break this down into smaller parts, um, do a little bit, take a break, do a little bit, take a break. That's why I give you a bunch of time. Here it is Thursday, you've got Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and most of Monday as well to um, work on these, um, these questions, right? So uh, it's a little more than one a day, but um, it, you should able to with that amount of time um, chip away at it and get it done uh, some people sit down and do it all in one go well it's all fresh in their mind that sort of thing this is going to involve reading it's going to involve thinking and it's going to involve going back to the videos and your notes so um, yeah, I know it's not easy the reason I am giving you an assignment like this is because I think you can do it Students in the past have done it and done it with great success. Um, I know it's a bit of work, but um, this is how we develop the facilities um, to analyze and evaluate philosophical arguments. And this is how we develop our ability to express complex ideas in plain language. So um, I look forward to reading your responses. Right? Um, and um, you have any questions please contact me and uh, we will talk it over all right have good days one for each of you